Okay, now let's review the six appealing points of Raputa. I've changed the outline since the last announcement because things kind of changed while I was getting ready. I've already talked about mysterious eroticism, contradicting cultural criticism, and unexplained characters. Today we'll continue with Raputa as a sci-fi movie, imaginary industrial revolution, and Bals and Hayao Miyazaki. About the last topic, Miyazaki has explained many times in the past what Bals meant. For example, he's told his animators that it meant peace in Turkish, or it was a word of doom. However, I think that's not really true. So I want to go in depth about what Bals actually is. Okay, since I finished the first three points, let's start with Raputa as a sci-fi movie. This is titled Profiles of the Future. It's written by Arthur C. Clarke. He's also known as the author of 2001 Space Odyssey. And this is the documentary that he wrote. Here, this is better. Actually, it's more like a non-fiction than a documentary. In that book, he wrote Clark's Three Laws, and the book explains what they are. For example, what happens if Leonardo da Vinci, Archimedes, or Galileo Galilei saw a helicopter or a car? The point is to discuss how difficult it is to predict the future. Some people often embrace human imagination by saying, look at these old documents, novels, and comic books. The modern times were predicted a long time ago. While others say, those are all wrong predictions of the future, so they are untrustworthy. Clark saw consistent laws in this kind of future predictions and advocated them. In the book he claimed, if we brought people from different eras 1,000 years apart from each other like Da Vinci, Archimedes, and Galileo Galilei, and showed modern technologies like helicopters or cars, they would understand their principles instantly and wouldn't have to think or investigate any further. That's because gasoline engines and airplanes were invented based on the physical laws from their time. So it's not so hard for them to understand those technologies. But it would either be impossible or difficult for them to understand such things like the TV, computer, or nuclear reactor because they didn't know that electrons or electric currents exist. The easiest example, according to Clark, is the atomic bomb. The simplest explanation behind the science is that you can create an explosion just by putting two masses of uranium together. So, what happens if we say that to a 19th century scientist? What if we tell them, if we put these together, we can create an explosion as big as two tons of coal? The scientists would be shocked and patiently ask, do you know the law of thermal energy? Then, using their far deeper knowledge about science such as the laws of physics and chemical reaction, they would spend a long time politely explaining to us how it would be impossible to create thermal energy just by putting two pieces of metal together. That's how nuclear reaction is out of paradigm for those who don't know it. Clark said that's why people couldn't understand it. So, after consolidating all the tendencies, he established three laws about future predictions. These are the three laws. This one doesn't glare, right? The first law says, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is most probably wrong. The second law, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And the third, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The third one is famous, but the second one is a bit difficult. What it is that Clark warned us not to say, something doesn't exist unless this was scientifically proven through numerous tests, and that includes superstitious phenomena like telepathy or psychokinesis. The second law explains what thinking scientifically means, and the third law is the most famous one, which many of you might know. My point is that Laputa is sci-fi and Miyazaki uses these three laws effectively in the movie. For example, the machines Dola and her family use are made from quite advanced technologies of that time, but they are still explainable. Something even Pazu can understand just by looking. 
But a lot of the technologies we see in the castle in the sky are unexplainable. These two types are contrasted, such as um, steam engines that use coal energy and petroleum combustion engines that the Dola family uses versus Raputa's ultra science. And that ultra science technology is divided into two layers. Miyazaki shows these different levels of technology to make such an, how should I say, interesting and profound world of science fiction. So, let's first look at the Tiger Moth. The Tiger Moth is an aircraft that the Dola family uses as a base. It's a bit less than 40 meters long. There's actually no official plan for this. When a food company called Ajinomoto sold a Raputa-related product, Miyazaki made one up. This is how it looks. Right here, there are four propellers rotating inversely. They're pretty complex. The majority of the heavy machinery in the world of Laputa is run by coal steam engines. The Tiger Moth has a petroleum combustion engine which drives these four propellers in opposite directions. So it's an intricate mechanism. So you might think that these wings with large propellers on each side are the main propulsion system, but they aren't. The aircraft makes a vertical ascent by tilting these wings up and down or steep turns by changing the pitch of the propellers. So again, this is a pretty intricate mechanism here. This is a scene where Pazu is taken to the engine driver. There you see these giant gears. Pazu instantly understands the mechanism because he's good with machines and starts helping out right away. That's the level of complexity. But they do everything from moving the wings to rotating the four propellers in the back and two large ones in the front using only one engine. So, the power transmission is extremely complicated. But a lot of factories during the Industrial Revolution had the same problem of having a complex power transmission system. This is not the best visual resource, but take a look. This is a copper plate print that shows a typical large-scale factory during the Industrial Revolution. You see how the belts stretch upwards? These belts are connected to the shaft at the ceiling. Steam engines outside the factory spin the shaft at high speed. Then, through the belts, the power gets conveyed to the weavers in front of the working ladies. That's how the weavers work. It means that a weaver is located in front of each working lady, but its power source is not inside the factory. It is the steam engine outside. And by running the engine vigorously, a huge shaft located at the center of the ceiling spins and spins and spins, and that's where the bells receive the driving force. Here's another picture, a more specific one from Lancashire, England. This one. This is a picture of a weaving factory in Lancashire. This is how it works. There is a huge spinning shaft that drives the belts with its power. That's why when we think of the machinery in the world of Laputa, we usually picture them with gears. But if we take a closer look, you also see these pulleys or belts as well. And when Pazu goes to the engine room of the Tiger Moth and the engine driver tells him to help, what Pazu does is switch gears. So, you can tell how the power transmission of the Tiger Moth is a lot more complex than the majority of the machinery in their world, which are usually steam engines. You can also tell that most aircraft operations are done in the engine room, such as changing the movement of the propellers or the angles of the wings are done mechanically by like shifting gears from here to there and switching the belts from that side to this side. It's like your bicycles. You know how you shift the five level gears on the back of your bicycles? When you do that, you see the chain switching from one gear to another. So, you see this control tower, which is at the front of the aircraft, is where Dola is. But all she does is give orders through the voice tube. Dola and the others just give orders on where to move the aircraft. 
Uh, and how to move the aircraft is all taken care of in the engine room. This system of control towers giving the orders and the engine rooms doing the actual machine handling is ideologically advanced in the context of 19th century technology. This is also an early stage automation system which eventually becomes mainstream. But then, these are the machines you see more in adventure stories than sci-fi. By the way, the tiger moth, actually, it's hard to open this with my nails. On the backside, there's a jump door for the flapters to fly out of the aircraft. And honestly, it's a sarcastic reference to Mobile Suit Gundam. In Gundam, everything from White Base to Zeon's Ga attack carrier, they all jump from the front side of the ship hull. And that's aerodynamically impossible. Miyazaki was like, cut the crap! If any aircraft has a jump door, it's in the back. So he deliberately showed a scene with the flapters jumping out from the back. To sum up, uh, a machine in Raputa, like the Tiger Moth, is not scientific enough to be considered sci-fi, although it's close enough. It's more adventure story-like. Next, how about the flapters that the Dola family uses? Oh, a wing came off, but don't worry, it comes right back on. Flapters fly using the vibration of wings moved by electrically powered artificial muscles, so it's half sci-fi. There is an image where the driver starts the engine by inserting a crank here and turning it by hand. That feels kind of retro, no? But the idea of using a generator to make electricity as a driving force is actually pretty new in the Industrial Revolution. Actually, generators were invented before motors. The mechanism of a motor was accidentally discovered during the Vienna International Exhibition in 1873 when an engineer wired a generator wrong and caused the backflow of electricity. But that made the generator start moving on its own and people were like, what? So the motor was discovered through that accident? But Dola's ex-husband or lover who invented the flapters didn't know the relationship between generators and motors. So he tried to move the wings by artificial muscles with the electricity generated by an engine. This idea of using artificial muscles with electricity was discovered by a doctor and physicist called Galvani in the late 18th century in Italy. He discovered that if you electrify the legs of dead frogs, they move. This is famous portrait of Galvani, but you see the image of a dead frog and electrode. It must suck for him to have this as the most famous portrait. Anyway, the discovery itself was super sensational. In high-class salons in Europe back then, not only sports and fine arts, but also science was a popular topic. Now, I already talked about this two years ago. A famous poet during that time called Lord Byron read Galvani's theory in a newspaper article. He was with his poet friend called Percy Shelley and his 16-year-old fiancé with whom he eloped called Mary. <laughs> well, there was one more person, but that's not important. When they were at the holiday house at the bank of Lake Leman in Switzerland, he read the article and said, this is cool, let's make this into a novel. And they said, yeah, let's do it. But only Mary actually wrote it. That novel she wrote about an artificial body that moves by electricity was later recognized as Frankenstein, but I already talked about this part a year and a half ago. Flapter is a machine that's made with shafts and gears, which people today can understand the structure of. So they are realistic except for the artificial muscles, which I think are more science fictional. Now, let's Move on to the third example. That is... Raputan Robot. Now, this is without a doubt 100% science fiction. Raputa becomes a sci-fi movie from around this point. So there's a scene in the movie where Muska tells Shita, we can't even find out whether the material used to make this robot is clay or metal. That's how puzzling this robot is. 
the material is expandable. According to Miyazaki's setting, it's made of shape memory ceramic. Shape memory ceramic is a material that can become soft or firm, but that just sounds mysterious. Plus, the robot can't be disassembled nor repaired. We can't even guess its component lifespan because most parts still move. Except some parts broke or decayed over centuries for reasons we don't know. We can think that the moving parts inside the body got worn down, but that's just our common sense. One Raputin robot still moves after being abandoned for 1,000 years, so maybe no moving parts were worn down. What a scary machine. We don't know its power source either. We don't even know if it's run by fuel or battery. We know it flies and accelerates with the jets on its chest. Then it needs fuel, but we can't tell where that fuel is loaded. Simply put, we don't know what's what. But considering the fact that it does break when air destroyer Goliath shoots it with a cannon at a close range, the robots are still relatively inferior compared to other Laputin machines. I'll mention this later, but I divide Laputa civilization into an early period and late period, and I have my own evidence for doing so. Well, it's more a ground of argument than evidence. The early Laputan civilization is completely incomprehensible like Levi Stones. But the late Raputan civilization is when Raputa ruled the world, which is what Muska believes to be Raputa's true self. But I think it wasn't until the late period that they started ruling the world with its military force. What we see in the movie as the relics of Raputa come from this period, now, I think we have a better understanding of them compared to the people in the 19th century. However, we can't understand everything. What we can understand is this. Shita says, save me and revive the eternal light. Then the robot starts moving. Then these strange wiggly parts pop out from here and start moving like a worm. What's interesting is that these parts sticking out from the upper arm that extends from its shoulder move. But then, uh, the parts on the other side of the body don't move, even after hearing the spell. It proves that the power unit is in the center of the body, so one of the shoulders that's connected to it moves instantly when Shida asks for help, but the other one remains dead because it's separated from the rest of the body. And that's a mechanism we know. After all, there's a power unit. Sure, the movement of the parts look mysterious and lifelike, but that just means they're very intricate and they're not beyond our understanding of technology. <laughs> so, let's say the Laputin robot is a technology that we can still kind of understand. Okay. Now from here, let's go into the ultra science of Laputa. I'll talk without any image for a while. A science fictional technology which we can't understand at all is Levy Stone. Levy stone is a stone that looks like a pendant that Shita wears on her chest. Shita's mom always told her to keep it a secret. It has a feature that is indistinguishable from magic, which corresponds to Clark's third law. First, it only takes orders from the successors to the Raputan thrones. And it has the power to cause a phenomenon that looks like anti-gravity. And it doesn't receive energy from anywhere. This technology looks as mysterious as the Raputin robots because they both come out in the same movie, but there is an obvious difference in the level of technology used for these two objects. As I said earlier, we can still understand Laputin robots, but the technology level of Levy Stones is at least 1,000 years ahead of the robots. The biggest difference is that Levy Stone cannot be put together, as there's no trace of it being built. Meanwhile, we can see how the parts were set up to build Laputin robots, since we can somehow see the parts that broke and got separated from the fall. It's like an iPhone. It can look mysterious, but we can take it apart. 
But we can't do that with a levy stone. It's just a piece of transparent crystal. There's no mechanism for us to analyze because it's just a mass. In a movie, it shoots a light beam to show the direction of Reputa, but we don't know its light source. You only see the light coming out from the somewhere inside the crystal. This is not because Miyazaki was ignorant of science, it's rather because he knew everything about Clark's third law. He intentionally depicted levy stones that way so that he could show us different levels of Laputin technology. It reacts to voice and confirms whose voice it is, so I guess it's got a voice recognition and genetic authentication features. But we still can't explain the energy used to create anti-gravity. Let's say Shida is 40 kilograms heavy, so you multiply that by the gravitational acceleration speed of 9.8 kilometers per second squared times 1,000 meters, which is the length of her drop. We need 4 million joules to neutralize her fall. In terms of calories, 900,000 kilocalories worth of energy is required, so getting that much energy from a five Five gram heavy levy stone is only possible if it uses nuclear reaction. That's how energy efficient it is. And I mean, the reason why, well, the reason why Laputa is covered by trees at the end is because one, it's Miyazaki's aesthetic, and two, levy stones can grow plants. Miyazaki has said in interviews, levy stones are a sacred origin of the universe. Shita could only survive by herself because her levy stone helped her farm grow well. Then why did the farms near the levy stone or the trees in Laputa grow excessively well? This is a scene uh, of Isotope Farm from Osamu Tezuka's manga called Phoenix. Isotope Farm was an actual plan in the 1960s. Isotope Farm has a tower in the center that emits radioactive rays. And the story is about a boy who is left behind at the farm by a broken robot. He says here, let me go, let me go, but at the end, he's left there for half a day and receives severe radiation damage. It's an episode about a robot called Robita, who gets executed later for doing this. So what's Isotope Farm? I've talked about this several times before, but it's called radioactive forcing. There has been a report in the 50s and 60s that plants grew undoubtedly better under the effect of radioactive rays. The isotope farm depicts that effect. But the anti-nuclear power trend today prevents new researchers from exploring this field, but the original data has also been lost. Like Uncle Palm says, levy stones radiate energy, but also vaporize quickly. It's an amazing technology, but people aren't supposed to touch them. So I think it's Miyazaki's metaphor of nuclear power. Uh, I said this in the last broadcast, but Miyazaki always wants a twist in anything he expresses. If a normal person came up with the metaphor of nuclear power, they would want to show that in the anime. But Miyazaki is the opposite. When he thinks of something like that, he tries his best not to make it obvious in his work. Anyway, levy stones are some kind of a natural energy source, which we shouldn't touch. Plus, it's something that emits blue light. This is a picture of fuel rods inside an actual nuclear reactor, where you see blue light inside. This phenomenon is called Cherenkov radiation. Cherenkov radiation occurs when fine particles come out from nuclear materials. They come out faster than the speed of light. But because nothing is faster than light in our world, those particles slow down to the speed of light. The moment they slow down, the energy generated by the change of speed is emitted from them as blue light. This is just for your reference, but Godzilla's back glows blue, and that's also Cherenkov radiation. When the first Godzilla shoots out fire, its back shines, which means a nuclear reaction as big as Cherenkov radiation is occurring inside Godzilla's body. You may think only Shin Godzilla is associated with nuclear reactions, but it's a consistent setting throughout the series. And 
What was often said before was that blue water that comes out in Nadia, the secret of blue water, was the same as levy stones. From this point, since I want to complete my lecture on Laputa today, I'll also talk about Nadia. When we made Nadia the secret of blue water, I was in charge of all the settings of blue water. I came up with its detailed settings, but some of those initial settings didn't fit the plot as production progressed. That's when I told the director, Ano, that he could change the setting however he wanted. But when Ano ran out of ideas, he would come back to me and ask, what was your setting again? And I'd explain to him, and he'd use the setting he liked for the plot. So I'm going to explain the first settings of Blue Water that I originally made. Now, Nadia was a Miyazaki ripoff project that came after Laputa. It sounds a bit harsh, but the truth is, NHK showed us their whole project called A Journey Around the World Under the Sea and said, make this into anime. We saw it and we're like, this is like Laputa. <laughs> but since it was an order, we had to make up settings to make it work. So, we came up with an item called Blue Water, which was a relic of ancient Atlantis. It's the initiator and energy source of the Tower of Babel and all other relics that come out in Nadia. So, what is Blue Water? Well, it's not material. It's actually a program. It's information, but because the amount of information is so large, it has a volume, texture, and visual mass as a result. The reason why it has mass, volume, and texture is because there's too much information in it. I mean too much information by all the information of the Earth from its birth to the present day, including all locations of every single atom. It's a recording device. One blue water can replicate everything from the entire earth, animals and plants, every person born until today, and all civilizations they have created. And that's an enormous amount of information. That's why it has substance, at least in our dimension. That was the setting. So, if you see up close, you can see numerous detailed patterns engraved on blue water. They indicate that if you look at it that close, then you can see the first layer of the inner structure. Below it are 10 more hidden layers, but in the physical world, we can only see up to the first layer. Now, getting to the important point. The enemy called Gargoyle, who is the leader of Neo-Atlantis, can't understand what Blue Water actually is, even up until his death in the end. He's not the only one though, because Captain Nemo can't understand what it is either. And perhaps the director, Ano, also couldn't understand it completely, even though I tried my best to explain it to him. The characters in the anime steal blue water from each other, but that's pointless, because it's just a recording device. No one can use it, even if someone steals it. Since Nadia is a tribute to Laputa, you can see something similar to the castle in the sky, and that is the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is portrayed as a laser beam weapon. The other one is Red Noah. That appears as one of the relics. Also, the new Nautilus. These are equivalent to the castle in the sky in Laputa. But there's something mysterious about Red Noah that appears toward the last episode of Nadia. That is, it doesn't have an ability to travel between planets. It flies over the Earth after Neo-Atlantis was revived, but it doesn't go any higher than that. It's because it can't. And that's because it's just a shuttle between the Earth and orbiting satellites. Then, what's the Tower of Babel? In the anime, because it has objects orbiting around it, like reflecting satellites, it looks like a weapon at a glance. But it's not. It's just a laser communicator. But because the output of the communicator is so big, it can turn into a weapon when it's used against the Earth. But it's only a communicator. It's a huge communicator that can reach up to several hundred to thousand light years away. It's merely a convenient device that transmits energy to anywhere on the Earth through the reflecting satellites in orbit. 
Although they don't come out in the anime, there were people called Atlantinians who arrived from planet Atlantis in the far past, passed on their technology to the human race, and developed ancient Atlantis civilization. They used the Tower of Babel to communicate with their home. But why is there such a misunderstanding? For example, we have a thing called a microwave oven. Its concept was accidentally discovered during a military radar test in the US. I think it was right after the end of World War II, when a man called, um, what was his name? Percy, something was standing in front of the radar, a chocolate bar in his pocket melted. He was like, what the hell just happened? And that led to the discovery. So the microwave was originally a radar, but later they found out that you could cook with it, and that's how the microwave was invented. Well, I heard they first made popcorn with it. Both Gargoyle and Captain Nemo are like those people who couldn't understand what a radar did. So, instead, used it as a microwave oven. Therefore, the Tower of Babel is a communication channel between the Earth and planet Atlantis, a hundred light years away. Although, after it's launched, it's used as a weapon. Now, there was an idea for the last episode of Nadia where Atlantinians are gods descend to us at the present time, which was 1991 back then. That was my idea. We had many different ideas like pattern A, B, C, and so on, but they were all turned down. Anyway, my initial idea about the setting was, so, the ocean was part of the world that people in the 19th century still had a longing for, since it was yet to be explored back then. But contemporary people like us cannot see the ocean in the way those people did. That's why my initial plan was to have our audience encounter something new in the last episode. And I think the same idea is applied to Raputa. That is, Muska thinks Indra's arrow is a weapon of destruction that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was something similar to a microwave oven. Now, let's move on to the fifth technology in Laputa, which is the castle in the sky itself. The free part is almost over, so let me extend. This is the picture of the castle that appears in the opening. And, um... Uh, it's got a large propeller underneath. This image is shown in the opening, but when I watched it for the first time, I was a bit disappointed. I was like, oh, Miyazaki-san is drawing retro machines with propellers again. But I was completely wrong. One of the interesting things about Laputa is that it tricks the audience in such a way. It's telling us that people who drew this only knew the castle through legends, so they could only imagine it with the propeller. That means the technology of Laputa is a lot more advanced than the people of the time, but because they use their limited knowledge to interpret the mechanism, they give it a propeller. Similarly, Muska knows what kind of features Laputa possesses, but he can't understand why they are there. That's why he thinks, this is a weapon, I'm going to rule the world with this. The castle depicted here is of course inspired by the famous painting, The Tower of Babel, by Bruegel. I also heard Angkor Wat, that's covered with trees, is also its image source. Anyway, the reason why I can't assert the Tower of Babel is the image source is because there are many concept images that Miyazaki drew. And these are the images that were actually used for the movie. There is a description about different layers of the castle. The top of the castle is the shrine. The first layer is the world of the Lord of Heaven, who is like the emperor. The second layer is the world of the knights, and you see the towers of the twelve heavenly generals, the third, the garden of heaven, and the fourth, the world of the people, and below, that is our world. You see the ground is attached under the castle from a time before it was in the air. It means the castle was originally on the ground and was later brought up to the sky. Now, I told you earlier that I'm suspicious of whether Laputa really ruled the world with its technology as Muska insists. My theory is that the Laputans in their early civilization were trying to meet their god, although there's no record and no one remembers them. 
But since it's a shrine here, it's equivalent to the Tower of Babel. They made the castle float in the air so that they could get close to and meet their god. That's their objective. That's why they lived in the sky. But because they later found out that it was impossible to meet the god, they ended up ruling the rest of the world with fear. That's Laputa as Muska knows it. Muska says Laputa is not an island of fantasy. It was once the ruler of the world using fear, namely nuclear power. But I think he's confusing the two different eras. The shrine was not exactly for worshipping. It's not that the god really lived there, but it was designed to invite the actual god. The castle floated in the air to meet their god, but they still couldn't reach this deity, so they made a shrine. I guess there were people called Laputans, and I'm guessing they were aliens who lived in space. And they taught humans their technologies, but humans couldn't understand the central theories. That's the reason why there were two different levels of technology. One that is incomprehensible, such as levy stones, and another that is somehow comprehensible for those who are educated about the Laputan civilization, like the Laputan robots. But now, I know what you guys are thinking. You guys are like, that's just your delusion. <laughs> now, look here. There is a note Miyazaki later crossed out. This is the key. <laughs> I, I enlarged it. If you look up close, oh, by the way, this picture is already published, so you've already seen it. Take a look. When the god descends to earth, an ancient city rises. The god's sacrament now governs the world, a sacred city in the sky. This indicates two different eras. It says, when the god descends to earth, so, a god or someone who they worship came down to the earth from the sky and lifted a city up to the sky as proof of the arrival. But now the city has turned into a sacred city that rules the world. Miyazaki wrote this description, but later crossed it out because he decided not to show it in the movie. This is the initial setting. But it's not like he got rid of it. He just decided not to explain it thoroughly in the movie. That's why there are two different stages to Laputan civilizations. Uh, by the way, Miyazaki often comes up with ideas which he later decides not to show. He does this all the time. For example, in Toshio Suzuki's radio show, he complained once, Miyazaki only wants to depict Laputa from Pazu's perspective, or how things look like in his eyes. According to him, Miyazaki didn't draw the entire image of the castle in the sky in the beginning. Suzuki said, draw the whole thing, you know the one floating between clouds? But Miyazaki refused and said, Pazu doesn't see the castle after he gets out of the thunderstorm, he's already at the castle. Now Takahata came and they both told Miyazaki, yeah, but people want to see it. They tried so hard to change his mind, so at last Miyazaki drew the castle, but it was half hidden by clouds. That's how much he, how should I say, this is my understanding of Miyazaki from what I've read, or the impression I got when I met him. He comes up with a thousand ideas and makes 100 of them into sketches, but ends up using maybe three of them. 1,000 versus 3. Out of a thousand, he actually draws or writes down 100 of them like the note I just showed you, and he only shows three. To Miyazaki, movie making is about how much you eliminate. Suzuki said Miyazaki drew so many sketches of the aircraft that comes out in the beginning of Raputa, but then he went, I'm not using any of these. Suzuki asked him, why aren't you using them? Then Miyazaki replied, that's a movie. You think and think and end up not using the majority of what you come up with. And the setting that he didn't use for Laputa is that. People came down from the sky and gave humans Laputan civilization. But since they are now gone, humans have decided to rule the world. This is the setting that you can read in the text I just showed you. <laughs> 
文章として残っているわけですね。えー、以上です。Okay! That was my defense against people calling my theories delusions. Now I'm finally done with the first part. What I will talk about for the rest of today is Laputa as a sci fi movie, Imaginary Industrial Revolution, and Balsa and Hayao Miyazaki. I'll talk about them in the limited broadcast. Now, the questionnaire, please. What's interesting is that we find the note I showed you or the enlarged copies of its pictures so easily, but no one tries to think about what Laputa really is. Instead, the audience hears the spoken lines during the movie, and that's it. They hear Muska say, Laputa really existed. It ruled the world with military force, and stop thinking any further. But if you think about what kind of a person Hayao Miyazaki is, you know that's not all. Okay, now the result. Nice! Thank you very much! Okay, now let's move on to the imaginary industrial revolution. So, guys, don't go to the bathroom yet. I'll finish the lecture without stopping. Okay, let's switch. Thank you for watching until the end. I am the most famous. Otaku King in Japan, Otaku King Toshio Okada. I started planning to talk overseas about animations and movies popular in Japan in English. Before long, I'm planning to add English subtitles to movie talking in Japanese. So please look forward to it. If you ask a, a question in this comment field of this video, maybe I will talk about comments as a theme. We welcome the people who are interested in the forefront of Japanese otaku culture and those who want to hear stories of interesting animations and movies. So please sub subscribe our channel. If there is good relation, I will get better and I will do my best. <laughs> Thanks.